God is so good to us, man. Praise the Lord, guys. You guys are awesome in leading us to the throne there. I'm serious. It's just, whoo, it's amazing, I guarantee you. When I hear them, it's com- that's comfort food to me. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but, man, when I hear them, they are just... They are just so uh, so blessed and so anointed by the Lord, and, and God uses them in such great ways, and, and they just flow with the Spirit of God and, and go into places where we need to be in order to kind of prepare us for what the Word is going to share with us here today. And I know some of you that picked up the notes before the service that I do for you every week, you know that we're dealing with, uh, with the fruit of the Spirit, which is goodness. We've we come now to the to the fruit of goodness in there, Galatians five twenty two and twenty three. Let me just put that back up there on the screen for you. There it is. And it's a listing of all of the fruit and what the Spirit is doing inside of us to recreate the nature and the character of God. Now, if you want to create the works of God, you create that with the gifts of the Spirit, which yeah. is, which are often talked about in connection with the fruit, and sometimes in people's minds and in people's conversation, they kind of get those mixed together. You know, they talk about the, the gifts and the fruit as if they're basically the same thing, but they're not. They're totally different from each other. The gifts of the Spirit recreate the works of God on this earth. When Jesus was here, Jesus worked the works of God. I know a lot of people think of Jesus as a freelancer. You know, he's the son of God. He is God. And we think that he came to earth and he did what he willed and what he planned and what he uh, made happen because he's God and God can do anything he wants to. But according to the testimony of Jesus himself, he said, Father, when he was praying that high priestly prayer the, the, the night before he was arrested and crucified, and so he prayed for his disciples and he, and he said, you know, Father, uh, uh, I do nothing of myself. Uh, I only do what I see you do. And I only say what I hear you say. So everything Jesus shared and did while he was on the earth was not his own doing, but it was the will of his Father And uh, Jesus performed the will of his Father, completely submitted to his Father to do only what his Father told him to do and and, and and allowed him to do and and wanted him to do to reflect uh, the works of God and how God works in the lives of people through miraculous things and common things and regular people and sinful people. (laughs) Yeah, we're a lot more choosy about who we think works for God than God actually is. God took a lot of people that weren't perfect in lots of different ways, and God used them mightily to do the works. Well, when Jesus left this earth, Jesus told his disciples in that same time, the night before He was arrested, and well, it was about midnight when he was arrested, and then he went through all those terrible trials before the sun came up, and then he was scourged and beaten and then put on the cross. And then before 6 p.m. of that same day, he was taken off of the cross because he said, it is finished, and he gave up the spirit. And they took him off the cross because uh, starting at 6 o'clock, Passover was starting, and you, you don't want anybody dead hanging on the cross on Passover. But in that night before, he he looked at them and he said, "Uh, guys, uh, I'm I'm going away, but don't worry because I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm I'm going away. I'll no longer be walking and talking with you and leading you and walking on the water and doing miracles and casting out. I'm not going to be here anymore but I'm not going to leave you alone because I'm going to my Father. And because I go to my Father, I'm going to send you another, uh, and the word, the Greek word is a parakletos, which we get our English word paraclete, which means one just like me. The word means not, not a substitute, uh, not, a, not a general description, but Jesus said, I'm going to send you one just like me, and he's going to live in you, and he's going to be with you. And of course, Jesus is describing the Holy Spirit of God that comes into our life when we receive Jesus Christ, 
miraculously, he who visibly left the earth has somehow now miraculously come back to the earth and he's living on the inside of us. And so now we not only have the ability led by the Spirit of God to do some of the works that God did led by his Spirit, not as we choose, but as he chooses. We don't get the gifts that we want. We get the ones that he gives us and he gives them to us at a time so that we can manifest to this world the greatness of the, of the might of the Father in heaven. But in order for that to be accomplished, I mean, would you trust your gift and all of that power to somebody who wasn't like you in character and nature? Why, well, surely not. It'd be like giving a 45 to a five-year-old. Yeah, too, too much power, uh, uh, too little uh, maturity. <laughs> so in order to receive these things, we have to reflect the nature of God, and that's where these gifts come in. These gifts describe the character of God and the nature of God. And if you're one of his, this descri- these describe you. And this is what your life is filled with. And this is what God is constantly doing in your life maturing you so that you can reflect these not by work that you do, but by who you are. Yeah, yeah. This is not something you do. This is something you are as the fruit of the Spirit. And we've been through love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness last week, and now goodness. Did any of you practice some gentleness this past week? <laughs> you know, that, that, that was something that I mentioned last week, and I don't want to get dragged back into all of that because I'm prone to do it anyway. But, um, <laughs> but you know, gentleness is just basically a, it, it's basically a kindness is what it pretty much boils down to. It could be the word kindness could be substituted for gentleness. Yeah. And I told you last week that, that kindness is a weapon. And I know most of the time we don't think of kindness being a weapon because we think sweet, gentle, you know, precious, and we think it's fluffy and soft and all of that kind of stuff. You know, we think of an, of an elderly lady sitting by a window drinking a glass of tea, you know, knitting or something. I, you know, we, we have images like that or a little baby wrapped in a soft blanket, and kind, you know, kindness. And you think of kindness, but I'm telling you, kindness is a weapon against evil. And kindness can tear evil up. I'm serious. And it is the only thing that will tear evil up. Somebody's being evil to you, you be kind to them, and kindness will paralyze evil. Kindness will stop evil in its tracks. Kindness will turn an enemy into an ally. Kindness will stop a plot of revenge. Kindness will push you forward when everybody wants to pull you back. I mean, it is a powerful, powerful weapon. And if you use it, evil has to go when kindness walks in. I'm serious. It's amazing how quickly kindness can destroy and paralyze evil in this life. And if you don't believe it, just try it. Just just do a little act of kindness to some old mean, ugly codger, you know, some, some Joe Rattlesnake. I don't care how mean he is, how bad he is, how rootin' tootin', you know, you know just, just do a little kindness, something that you don't have to do that's kind, and watch what kind of attitudes right. change right. by a simple act of kindness. Now, you can't do it as a manipulation. You have to do it out of a heart that's real. But if you do that, I guarantee you, you'll watch evil just right in front of your eyes. Well, now we're on goodness. And how would you define goodness? You know, we sang about our good, good father, and we sang about God is so good, he's so good to me. Uh, How would you define good? Uh, we, we, We have the same problem in defining good as we do in defining love. We use love so many ways. You know, we love our children, we love our wife or our spouse, we love our pets, we love apple pie, we love a beautiful sunset. Obviously, all those kinds of loves, or we, we mean different things by the word love. Same word, though. We use love lots of different ways, and, and we mean lots of different things by the way we use it. Same thing with the, with the word good. You know, we talk about good food and good weather, and that was a good report, or have a good day, or you did a good job. 
That's a good distance away. Uh, yeah, we just use good in a lot of different ways, and we mean different things when we say the word good. When I was a teenager, I would have people say to me, well, have fun and be good. And I always thought that was pretty much a contradiction of terms because I would think, how can I be good if I'm having fun? And now after 45 years of being a pastor, I, I now have to be good. I mean, you expect me to be good, right? I mean, you expect your pastor to be good. And, and, and so really now, you know, follow me, technically I'm paid to be good. Right? Yeah, sure. I'm paid to be good. See, you guys are good for nothing. But I'm paid to be good. And so, and so how, would you define, how would you define goodness? Well, if you're thinking about looking in the dictionary, let me just save you a little time and trouble. In the dictionary, there are about 17 categories of definition for the word good. And each one of those categories has about three or four different uh, uh, illustrations or concepts of that, of that word. And the same is true in the Greek and Hebrew Bible. They don't really give you any real narrowing help to define the word good. So I know somebody's saying, well, let's just go to the Bible and let's see what the Bible says good or goodness means. Well, if you're going to do that, let me tell you what you'll find you're going to find that the Bible has a lot to say about good or goodness. You look up in your concordance, if you happen to have one, or on the internet concordance, which is probably a little bit easier to use because it totals them up for you. But if you do that, you're going to find that in the Bible that you're going to have, uh, using the word good or goodness, you're going to have 696 times in the Bible, the word good or goodness is used. <laughs> Everybody say goodness. <laughs> goodness gracious. Yeah, yeah. So what I thought we would do, and I want, I'm going to have to get Keith to lock the door. I think, I think it's locked and our guard is out there. So I just warn you, he's armed, so don't try to make a break for it today. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the first time it's used, and then we're going to just take them one at a time, all right? And we'll, we'll be here next week. Nobody gets to go home until we use them. Well, no. Uh, but let me, and don't get nervous. I'm just going to start use about two or three little uh, biblical references to show you the word good or goodness, and let's kind of get a, a definition somewhat of what the word would mean. Uh, in the first time the words used in the Bible is in actually in the book of Genesis. In the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, you know what happens. Uh, the earth is created, right? That's right, that's right? Well, when God looks at, at the earth, it, it, he says it's without form and it's void and darkness covers the faith of the earth. And then God speaks. And when God speaks, God begins to create this, this earth that we live on. And he he, he separates the heavens from the earth, and then he creates everything that is life in the sea, and then he creates everything that is life in the air, and then he creates everything that is uh, life on ground. And after each one of those creations, God says, and it was good. So what does he mean when he, say, when he says, it's good? Well, when God looked at what he had done, evidently he was pleased with what he did. And so God said that what I have done is good. So we could say then, according to the word of God, what good means is something that pleases God. Or if we want to get a little more personal about it, we could say goodness, a good person is someone who pleases God. At Promise Keepers, how many of you were involved in Promise Keepers at all? That was back in the late 80s, 90s. I know it's still going on today, but back then it was really a big movement, you know. Justin and I went to uh, Washington, D.C. and was part of that couple of million people on the big mall there where the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial and the steps of the Capitol and all that. I mean, it was gigantic. It was unbelievable. Christian men, about two, about 
about a million or two. I don't know how many they estimated, but it was just whoo, gigantic from side to side. We were there from five o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the, a- in the afternoon, sitting on the ground out there and standing and praising. And what but at Promise Keepers, we were taught a phrase. And you know what that phrase is because we use it all the time. And that phrase is, uh, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Well, what makes God good? Well, God is holy. That's good. God is love. That's good. God is forgiving. That's good. God is generous. (laughs) So that's good. So therefore, if we're good people, it means we're going to have the same characteristics that God does. We're going to be holy. We're going to be forgiving. We're going to be loving. And we're going to be generous in life. One of the most unusual references that you'll find for the, for the goodness of God is found in the book of Romans, and it is uh, this verse right here. By the way, if you're going to look this up, write the right one. I did this and messed it up. It's Romans chapter 2, verse 4, instead of 4 up there. I, I just left the wrong number in there. Romans chapter 2, and look at what it says. This is an unusual thing to say. Watch it. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? That's the Apostle Paul challenging the Romans about how they act and how they are on the basis of, of God himself. So he's talking to him and he's, he's in the middle of, a, of a, you know, an argument about this thing. And he says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance, his long suffering? Look at this line. Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It's the goodness of God that makes us repent, that leads us, that causes us to repent. There seems to be some kind of a, for lack of a better way to say it to you, a a sadistic quality, if you want to look at it that way, that we all have in our lives. I'm sure it's there by the crumbs that have been left over of our old nature, you know, Our old nature's been purged, but there there, there might be a little crumb or two left behind. And that little crumb or two kind of has a sadistic kind of nature that, that, that really, and follow this, that really wants God to kick the thunder out of us when we're bad, when we sin. Sinners many times inside of them have their heart screaming out when they know they're sinning against God kind of crying out to God saying, stop me, stop me, stop me, God. Punish me when I'm bad. I need to quit this, Lord. You know, mash me and judge me and punish me and kick the thunder out of me when I'm bad. But when we read the Bible, especially like the book of Revelation as an example, we find out that when God does kick the thunder out out of mankind, when God brings tribulation and God brings Uh, wrath and God brings uh, uh, all manner of harshness and punishment against man, that that the more God brings judgment and the more God brings tribulation, the harder men's hearts get and and the more hateful they get toward God and the more they gnash their teeth and curse God and hate God. The only thing that the only thing that we find in the scripture that will bring men to repentance is the goodness of God. Judgment does not bring men to repentance. Harshness does not bring men to repentance. Anger, wrath does not bring men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that brings men to <laughs> repentance. Once we once we've made peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes our good shepherd. And we do good things because he's our good shepherd. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus calls himself. Jesus, remember in John 10, you remember what Jesus said about the shepherd? He said, I am the good shepherd. And a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So Jesus, once we make peace with God through receiving Jesus Christ into our life, Jesus becomes our good shepherd. We are his sheep, and he is our good shepherd. And the Father becomes 
our good, good father. <laughs> yeah, that's what we just sang about. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. I am one of your sheep, and I am loved by you. So a simple definition then just of goodness, and this is just a real concept and, and a simple definition, I think, uh, would be uh, goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. If I do the right thing for the right reason, if I practice the right things with the right motivations, then I would be good. That would be a good thing. And so what is it that a good shepherd, which Jesus is, and a good, good father, which our father is, what would they do in order to bring into our life the fruit of goodness, the, 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 the essence of being good? Because we absolutely know, don't we, that this earth is not impressed by Sunday sermons. Most of them don't ever hear one. And if they do hear one, I can guarantee you they're not impressed by it. So this old cruel world that we live in is not impressed by words, right? Words that you verbally witness to them, don't they mean, most of the time shun away, you fuddy-duddy religious you crackpot idiot. And they certainly don't listen or hear sermons. And so what, what could God do on this earth to prosper the fruit of his goodness other than to work in his sheep, his children, the quality of goodness so that this world who hates him and they don't even know him, if they knew him, they wouldn't hate him. If they knew him, they would love him. They would know his intentions are to love them and not to destroy them. I mean, the devil teaches them and preaches in their ear every day, God hates you. He's after you. His wrath is on you. He doesn't care about you. He wants to kill your fun. He's a cosmic killjoy. Me, 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 me. It's what the devil's telling them every day. And the words we speak and the sermons we preach just bounce right off of them. Like they have some kind of force field all around them. But there's one thing that a good shepherd and a good, good father could do in us in order to break down that shield, and it would be that they fill us with goodness, and then they say, get out there and live before men so that men will see the goodness that I am, and men will be impressed uh, about me because of the goodness that is in you, and we're going to change this world that we live in. It's not going to happen through a sermon. It's not going to happen through a word. It's going to happen through you living out goodness and the world seeing the goodness of God and going, man, what in the world are these people all about? Goodness, my goodness. Well, actions. Yes, sir, buddy. That's right, Bill. Actions. Well, where are we going to see this goodness? How would we understand it? What would we, how would we see it? Well, what I want us to do is go to the most famous psalm in the world. And of course, you know I'm talking about Psalm 23, right? Everybody knows Psalm 23. Matter of fact, people that don't even know the Lord know Psalm 23. <laughs> many, many of them have memorized it and they know it by heart. I'll guarantee you that most of you have never been to a funeral at any time that, it, that some part of the 23rd Psalm isn't mentioned in that funeral. However, the 23rd Psalm has nothing to do with death. I'll just tell you that. It just has the word, the valley of the shadow of death, but it's not talking, of, the Psalm 23 is not talking at all about death, it has nothing to do with death. It has everything to do with life. It's a, it's a Psalm about, about a shepherd and his sheep and how God is like a shepherd and his sheep. God is the same thing with, with us and, 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 and him. And so it's a comparison to compare life of a good shepherd to his sheep to, to a good father with his sheep. And it was written by David. David was two things. David was a king and David was a shepherd. Before David was a king, he was a good shepherd with a clear heart, with a compassionate heart. You remember, he's a boy. 
And Samuel comes and anoints him when he's a little boy. He comes to Jesse's house. You remember the story. He comes to Jesse's house and he says, God has sent me to anoint the future king of Israel. Bring in your boys. It's one of your boys. And David is so singularly unimpressed, unimpressive that Jesse, his own, that, that his own father, looks at him and brings in the seven boys, his seven sons, and the Spirit of God doesn't move on Samuel's heart for any of them. And Samuel looks at him and says, none of these are it. Do you have any more sons? Yeah, I have one more, but he's kind of musical, kind of dingbat little fella. He, he's out there keeping the sheep, you know. He's singing to them. He's dragging that harp all over the place out there. And I don't know, uh, you know, I'm surely it's not him. And Samuel says, we'll stand up and wait for him to come. And when he walks into the room, God touches the heart of the old prophet and, and says, that's, that's my man right there. That boy right there is my man. Anoint him. And Samuel anoints David to be the king of Israel when he's just a boy. And then you remember what happened. God sends him back out to the fields to take care of sheep. God didn't take him to the palace. God sent him back out there to prepare to be a king so that when he gets in the palace, he, because he's a great shepherd, he'll be a great shepherd of the kingdom of Israel. He'll be a great king. And he encounters all those terrible things, the lion coming after his sheep, the bear coming after his sheep, uh, the big guy with Goliath and fighting and the sling. And then, I mean, this is David. And I'm not sure when Psalm 23 was written at what time in David's life whether he was a shepherd at that time or whether he was a king thinking back, but you can tell by all the references to shepherds and sheep and all that stuff in Psalm 23 that that, uh, that time really impacted David's life where he was, uh, where he was uh, uh, anointed as a child to be the future king and I think the greatest king that Israel ever had. And so in the 23rd Psalm, you see a picture of good, a good shepherd. What does a good shepherd do for his sheep? Meaning, and I don't want to try to be too symbolic, but you do, do know that many, many of the stories of the Bible are intended to speak to us. They're not just simply about a sheep and a shepherd. They're, they're meant to symbolize us and God. And they are in many ways really alike. They look at your neighbor and say, you're a sheep, all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you're a sheep. Boy, they have some really tough characteristics. Mm. Mm. So, all right, let's look, let's look then at, 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 at four uh, attempts or, or thoughts of goodness that run through Psalm 23. How, how does God use goodness to, to provide for us so that we can reflect his goodness out there. What would the fruit of goodness be all about? All right, here's Psalm 23. There are four things that show it in Psalm 23. First of all, the Lord provides for our physical needs because, after all, we are first and foremost physical creatures, right? Yeah, you have skin and blood, and you need a lot of things in order to just physically uh, stay alive. Right? We fall victim to physical things quicker than anything. You can't live but about two or three minutes without air, right? You can only live maybe a few days without water. You might be able, you wouldn't like it, but you might be able to live a few weeks without some food. <laughs> Ooh, if you've ever tried it, it gets more and more difficult, right? Yeah. So first and foremost, we are physical creatures. So what does a good shepherd do to, to meet the needs, the first needs that we have, which the immediate needs which we have are physical needs? Well, it says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. So the good Lord is my shepherd and as my shepherd, he is out in front leading me in order to provide the physical needs in my life. So the first physical need that I have in my life is I need some grass and I need some water, right? Well, in the Holy Land, and to think of the Holy Land, we're talking about the Middle East, and I know most of us have not been to the Middle East, but I'm told that the climate and the, and the territory of the Middle East looks a whole lot like West Texas. Have you ever been out in West Texas? 
Uh, does the road runner sound familiar to you in any way? And the coyote and the cactuses and the cliffs and the nasty and the dry and bare. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Holy Land is much like, is much like uh, the, the, the West, West Texas. And so green grass and steel waters are very hard to come by. That's why the shepherds would risk taking the sheep into the valley of the shadow of death because in the bottom of the valley, it's green grass and steel water that's flowing in the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, valley of the shadow of death. And so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The first thing he does is he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Sheep don't like dry desert grass. As a matter of fact, they won't eat dry desert grass. They want live green grass is what they want. So what is David saying about the goodness of God? He's saying that my shepherd is so good and he's so competent at meeting my needs that I don't have to worry about running out of food and water. He knows where the green grass is. And as a matter of fact, He's so good and competent and capable, he not only knows where enough grass to sustain me is, he knows where enough grass is that I can even lie down in that grass. <laughs> you would think with so many sheep and such a small supply of grass that, that uh, the shepherd might have to ration it out a little bit. Okay, sheepy number one, you can eat four or five blades of this grass right here. I go in. And sheepy number two, you get four or five blades of this, and then just go on down the line because you'd have to, to ration it out. But, but my good shepherd says, you don't have to do that. I can take care of you, and I will take care of you, and I'll take care of you so good that you not only will have enough to eat, you'll have enough to lie down in that stuff that you eat because I'm going to make sure that you do. And that's what Psalm 37, verse 25. Have you ever read this verse? Look at it. It's kind of a strange little word, but look at it. David said, I've been, I've been young and now I'm old. <laughs> How many of you can identify with that? I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Look at your neighbor and say, you're one of God's seed, right? <laughs> yeah. David said, I'm, I'm, I'm old now, and I've been with the Lord a long time, and let me just tell you what I've never seen. I've never seen God letting his people starve to death. That's what David is saying. And I'm saying to you the same thing. I know that people do starve to death, that this world has people in it that starve to death. But I'm just telling you that you will have to look long and hard. I mean, long and hard you'll have to look on this earth to find true, born-again Christians that are starving to death in this world. It just seems like God somehow does exactly what he says, and he has this way of taking care of his people. It's miraculous God meets their needs. Let me tell you, give you a testimony that I've seen with my own eyes. Back in the late 80s, I spent about, uh, what was it, 20 days in, in India, twenty something like that, in, it seemed like 20 years, but it, about 20 days, I went over and I taught in a seminary and I did some stuff. You can't uh, preach on the street in India and all that kind of stuff. India has a quarter of the population of the world in it, by the way. It's one-sixth, don't want to get too technical, but I do want you to kind of have an idea. The, India, the, the nation of India is one-sixth the size of the United States, uh, but it has 25% of the population of the world. So you know what that means, every little nook and cranny, every little city, they call a 250,000 person uh, gathering a village, that's what they call it. And the villages usually don't have any medical facilities or any uh, sanitation department or hospitals or anything like that. It's just a, woo, it's a tough place. But what they would let you do as a Christian, they would let you come in and welcome you to come in and they wouldn't bother you and they... They would let you come in, and as long as you went somewhere and went into a facility like a little school and you could teach about the Bible and Christianity, or you could go in somebody's home, you couldn't set up a little preaching station out on the corner, but you could go in somebody's house. And here's what I found out. The reason the Indian government, and there are nine different religions that are represented in India, the greatest group of people in India, or the biggest group, are Hindus, 
about probably almost 80% of the country are Hindus. The second largest group are Islamic people. And then the third biggest group are the Sikhs. And they're all kind of a little bit of a flavor of each other, but they're just a little bit different. But so those are the three biggest religions. About 2% of the country is Christian, if you're wondering how many Christians are there. But, but when I was there, I learned, here's what I learned. Uh, the reason that they were not um, uh, distant and, and restrictive to Christianity and that they liked Christianity is they found out that when Christians came into the country, and established a, a, a population where many of that population in a certain area went, became Christians and came to Christ, the whole uh, element of that area elevated itself. Every bit of it, social life, physical life, food, medicine. I mean, it, they said it's miraculous when Christianity comes to an area, that area just kind of lifts Everything in that area kind of lives for itself. Everybody say, that's because we have a good father. <laughs> that's because we have a father that takes care of his sheep physically. He is my good shepherd and I shall not want. <laughs> yeah, and he leads me. Uh, uh, he, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. The second phrase, he leads me beside still waters. Now, I'm going to tell you this, and, and I know it's going to be a little contrary to what you've always heard, and I, I did a lot of research on this. I even went to websites and, and chat rooms where shepherds actually were talking about it, actual ones that are real shepherds right now were talking about it. I've always preached and I've always heard that, uh, that sheep will not drink from running waters. And I've always taught that and I've always said that, that a sheep is so shy and so timid and so bashful that it won't run, it will not drink because it's fearful. They're timid from this running water, but that is absolutely not true. It's, a good, it's, it's good to think about and you want it to be true because it'd be a great illustration if it was true, but they will drink. I mean, you can actually go online and find pictures of them drinking out of a river or a creek and it's flowing and you can obviously see all of that. But David says, uh, as a shepherd, that my good shepherd not only leads me to green grass, but he leads me to still waters. Because still waters are waters that are not frightening. I told you that uh, uh, sheep are some of the most timid animals of all, and they're, they're very easily uh, frightened, and loud noises just scare them to death. And remember, Israel is mountainous country, and it's very hard to find a stream that is not running down a mountainside somewhere. But David is saying, my shepherd takes care of me and he knows where the peaceful waters are so that I can drink and be satisfied and not be afraid because something is scaring me. As a matter of fact, most of the shepherds in the, in, in the Holy Land draw water from a well and then put it in a trough and let the sheep drink from a little trough. I mean, think about Zipporah and her sisters. If that name's not familiar to you, let me just say who she is. Zipporah is the wife of Moses. And when Moses was going to the backside of the desert, he found Zipporah and her sisters in a little place called Midian, and they were drawing water out of the well, poured it in a trough so that their sheep could drink from the, salt, from, from the trough. Everybody say, still waters. Still waters. So he he, he makes us to lie down in green pastures and then he leads us b beside the still waters. And so meeting our physical needs is one of the goodness of God kind of things. And he says, I'm going to meet your needs because I'm your good father. Number two, second thing we see, area of life that we see meeting, showing us that God is good to us is the Lord restores our soul. He not only phys physically meets our life, he, 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 he restores our, uh, our psyche, our, <laughs> our soul, our nature. See, it's very common by about 10 or 11 o'clock in the, in the day that a sheep that is really heavy with wool and, and, and is heavy itself that for them to be miserable and to be fatigued to the point that they'll just lay down and it's really hard to get them up and get them going in, in, in the shepherds have to, have to goad them up and spark them up because they want to lay down and not move any further. 
So when the sun gets real hot, how many of you ever had something get real hot in your life? <laughs> huh? Yeah, a lot of hot stuff in life, right? So when the sun gets hot and, 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 and when the pressures of life get, get heavy, how many of you have ever had any pressures in life? Boy, they get heavy. So my life can get hot and heavy real quick. The psalm says that when that happens, that the Lord restores my soul. Now, I don't want to get too deep in this, but I just want to remind you that you are a spirit. Everybody say, I am a spirit. The real me is a spirit, right? When I go to a funeral and I look at somebody in a casket or I look at some ashes in an urn, I'm not really looking at the real you. That's not the real you. The real you has already gone on to glory or wherever you went, you know, by your choice. So the, the real me is a spirit. I have a soul. The soul is the seat of my intellect. It's the seat of my will. It's the seat of my understanding. Right now, you are listening to me with your soul. Your soul is listening and making choices and making discernments in life. So I am a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in a body. So I'm a three-part being. And so what this psalm says is that that soulish part of my life is the part of my life that can get down on itself. My soul can get depressed. My soul can get lonely, you know. My soul can get distracted. I mean, my soul is greatly affected by the essence of life. And David says that God restores my soul. He picks me up and he revives me and he rejuvenates me because he restores my soul. Verse 3, it just says it right on. He restores my soul. And then he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yeah, he leads me. He leads me. Because your neighbor say, he's leading me. You know what that means, right? That means he's out front speaking to you. If he's going to lead me, it means he's out there in the front saying, hey, boys, come on. Or go this way. Or you get that pile. Let me get this pile. Come on. No. And you are, and, and he's leading you. He's out front leading you. Now, how does God speak to you then? So that you'll know where to go. Yeah, everybody that was with us in the, in the experience in God knows that the principle, the fourth one, which is the longest one, there's seven of them, but the fourth one says, God speaks to me through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. So how is God speaking to you? Well, he's speaking to you through his word, the Bible. When you open up and read the word, the Spirit of God uses that to lead you. You've read passages before and it's spoken out of that passage and you said, how have I never seen that before? How did I ever, my Lord, I didn't know that. Woo, I missed that. I've read that 25 times and I've never seen it. And all of a sudden God reveals truth because truth is not discovered. Truth is revealed by God. So he uses the word to reveal it. And then sometimes when you're praying, there's a there's an impression of the heart. There's a heaviness of the soul. There's a conviction in the life. Your will breaks out and things begin to happen that change uh, you know, the nature of your will. And, and then sometimes it's uh, circumstances. Man, God uses circumstances like you wouldn't believe. You're at the right place at the right time. You hear the right thing. Whew. A reckless car ran out of gas before it hit you. <laughs> You know, God protects you and God uses circumstances to bring you where you need. And then the church obviously means everybody that's a Christian, not just somebody up here preaching to you. But a lot of times it is preaching that changes you. I think as a matter of fact that preaching has the best insight to change your life really because I'm not talking to you personally so you don't have your radar up going, well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm talking to everybody. So you can receive it when I'm talking to everybody because you don't think I'm talking to you. Well, I don't think I'm talking to you either. I don't know what's going on in your head, but I can guarantee you that if something's convicting you, I am talking to you because God wants you to hear what he's saying to your soul so that your soul can make a determination of your will and change the way you walk in life. 
This is how God restores your soul. He leads you in paths of righteousness so that his name can be honored on this earth for his name's sake. So what if I don't walk in these paths of righteousness? Well, the world's going to get this warped view of God because the world can't see God. It can only see the people that represent God. And if we don't walk in paths of righteousness led by God, they're going to get the wrong impression of God. They're going to look at us and go, God is funny. God is ridiculous. God is stupid. I don't want to follow him. Look at that uh, rascal over there. And man, I don't want to be like that. And that's the warped view. So you are representing the name of God. You are, you are saying I am God's namesake. You know what a namesake is? Somebody, somebody that reflects the, the, the owner of the name in likeness and means I'm like him. I'm like a little, you know, uh, Justin had a namesake and he named him Justin Jr. Justin Jr. would need to be like Justin Sr. to be his namesake because when people see Justin Jr., they're going to think of Justin Sr., right? So he leads me in paths of righteousness so I can reflect his name and reflect everything about him and reflect the fact that, he, that he's good and he's loving and so forth. So that's why the good shepherd uh, leaves us here so that when people see us, that they think of God and they have a right view of God, not some kind of warped view of God. And then verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. That's just talking about the valley of the shadow of death. The valley of the shadow of death is a real place. I mean, I mean, it's actually a real place. The valley of the shadow of death is a deep crevice with high walls. It's usually used, or lots of times, it's used as a, as a graveyard. Uh, not, maybe not now, but back in those days, there were bodies buried there. There were tombs carved in the rocks and blah, blah, because it was, it was dark and it was cool down in these valleys. And in these valleys, uh, because it was cool, and because there were usually moisture in the deep, uh, there was green grass in the valleys. Yeah, if you want to feed your sheep some real good, deep, green stuff, get in the valley of the shadow of death because that's where the grass is and that's where the water is and that's where the coolness is. And so the shepherd would lead them through the valley of the shadow of death. And the psalm says, look, what God is saying to me is my shepherd is so good that even though I'm walking through the deepest fear or the deepest emotional pressures in my life because he keeps me in line and beats away those things that hurt me, I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not fear any evil in my life. And so, and so I can walk because God is good to me. The thing I've noticed is my good moms are like that. Good dads are like that. Good friends are like that. They're not always threatening you and pressuring you to be, to be something or, or trying to fearfully lead you or accost you in some way. They're just supporting you with goodness. So they reflect the good shepherd. Let me give you the third one. I know I'm, I'm flat running way out of time, but I'm, let me just quickly do it. Number three, all right, God supplies our physical needs. God restores my soul. Number three, the Lord protects us from our enemies. And in doing this, and I'm going to give you just a, a, some thoughts about verse 5, and they're probably a lot different than you might have thought of verse 5 before. I know every one of us have read this psalm, and you probably have it memorized. And you've memorized, you, they, you prepare a table before me in the very presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely then goodness and mercy is verse 6. But you think about verse 5, and what are you thinking? You're thinking that God has a table, and that he puts your stuff on a table like a banquet table, and, and your enemy's out there watching, and, you're, and he's doing this so that he can honor you in the presence of your enemy, you know, like, ha, 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 you know, oh, God, he loves me, you know, God takes care of me, and the enemy's out there, and the enemy can't attack you or do evil while God set the table before you. And then when, he gets through, when you get through eating, he takes a, a cup of oil and he pours that cup of oil on you and it trickles all down your head. And he, and he does that because he loves you and he respects you and he honors you and so forth. And that's what anointing generally means. And then 
uh, he has so much oil left over or he catches the oil and, and, and the cup runs over. That's what you generally think, right? That's how you visualize pretty much that verse. But that, mm-mm. No, I, I, I know, and this is going to be a little contrary to what you think and what you've always heard, but I'm going to tell you this is what I believe that this verse means and what it's saying. There was a practice in the days of David, the king, when there was a battle or an incursion anywhere into enemy territory, that on the night before the battle was to be fought the next morning, that the armies of Israel would set up a banquet table within earshot of the enemy. They would take this table out and make sure they were close enough for uh, whoever those hostiles were, just, just out of sight, but certainly within earshot. And they'd set that table up and have a banquet there. Now, they wouldn't drink. They were sober, completely sober, because they had a battle in the morning, remember. So it wasn't like a loud, raucous party with a bunch of drunks hooting and hollering and, you know, rooting and tooting, kind of shooting thing, you know. But it was a loud, raucous, noisy, happy celebration. The only one that could eat from the table was the king, though, now. But they set that table up within earshot of the enemy, and they did this to demoralize the enemy. Because when the enemy heard all the loud, raucous, happy, joyful celebration at a table, the enemy said, my Lord, what kind of people are these? They're so confident that they're going to win the victory tomorrow. They're having a party tonight. Who are these people, man? What in the world? We better get out of here. They're going, whoo, man, I don't want to fight anybody like that. These people are crazy. And they did it to demoralize the enemy and to pronounce the confidence that God was going to lead them through. So what, 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 what God preparing a table in the very presence of our enemies is talking about is God gives me so much confidence and so much courage that I can sit in the presence of my enemy with all kinds of confidence that I can defeat my enemy because my good shepherd is leading me into that battle. And then anointing your head with oil, this is a crazy little thing, and I don't want to get too technical and drop in too, too much of a, of a little lesson here, but uh, the Hebrew word that's translated anoint is the word mashak. Every time the word anoint is used in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word mashak is used. And it means to anoint, just like you think it means, to put something on your head and let it run down and drip. That means to anoint. The word that is used in this verse is not mashak. So why did they translate it anoint? Because every other time, it's never, never any other word for anoint other than mashak. Well, I think it's probably because when the translators came along, uh, it was like, well, what else could you do? On the head with, with some oil, you know? But anoint, it's got to be anoint, you know? But the word deshante means to, uh, it really means to fatten, fatten, like fathead, <laughs> or fertilize something, to refresh it, to freshen it. And that's the word David used. So I'm just thinking, all right, the Holy Spirit's telling David what to write, I believe that, that God, God wrote the word and he just used us to write it, but he inspired every word. And I'm just saying if the Holy, Holy Spirit wanted the word anoint there, he would have said mashak. But he didn't say mashak. He said deshante, which means I don't want the word anoint there. I want you to tell them that after I've set the table in the very presence of mine enemies, I'm going to give you a fat head about things. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your brain and I'm going to give you confidence and vitality. I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you a, a, a belief that will carry you into this battle. I'm going to refresh your mind. I'm going to give you not only uh, uh, the physical issues, I'm going to tell your brain that it can be confident that I'm taking you through. Because after all, every battle starts right here, right? The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so before you fight a battle against the enemy, 
You got to see the battle going on in your brain. And God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put a table right there and we're going to scare the enemy to death. Because, buddy, you can have confidence that I'm with you and we'll just demoralize our enemy before we ever go into that battle because I just like making fun of him. And then I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to, I'm going to fatten your head. I'm going to fill your head with confidence and vitality and courage and the spirit to know that you can win the battle and then because it's no need for sobriety, and don't get you offended by that, sobriety means soberness, right? Because after the battle is fought, there's no reason to be sober. So here's my cup, baby, fill it up. Don't just fill it up, overflow it. <laughs> yeah, because, the, because the, the, the wine always represents joy. The wine always represents enthusiasm and excitement. And so God, hey man, after you led me through all that and it's over with and we won, fill her up, baby. I want to enjoy life with you. And that's what those verses mean. So he, he protects us from our enemies. Number four, and I'm just going to quickly say this. The Lord's goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life and beyond. The shepherd's always out front and leading us right. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse six says, surely, oh, let me put it up there. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the shepherd's out front leading us. And then our shepherd has two sheep dogs that help him with the sheep. You know, working dogs like Shelties and, uh, and uh, what Border Collies and um, Australian Shepherds and stuff. I mean, these, these, these dogs that work herds, right? I think, Bill, you had a... You had some uh, border collies, were the, what they were. He had a bunch of goats in a pasture, and he had this border collie. And he said, watch this. And the, all the goats were kind of scattered on the one end down there. And he called, he called, he called, he called, that, he called that border collie. And that border collie looked at those goats down there like this. And he said, he's looking kind of up at Billy, looking at the looking at goats. And Jesus said, and he took off, and those goats you know, kind of jumped up before. I mean, he was like half a pasture away from them. And they jumped, when they saw him, they jumped up and they started running around in a circle like that. And then they started running toward the barn. He didn't even, he didn't even have to really get them because as soon as they saw him coming, they knew what was going to happen. And he was running around behind them, nipping them, nip, 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 you know, and curled them in. And if one kind of went out, he went out and got that one and rammed them back in and pushed everybody forward. And so our shepherd is out front leading us. Us, but now follow this. Uh, anybody that's straggling, anybody that's you know out of line, out of step, God has two sheep dog that are coming behind him and keeping us all pushed together and following the shepherd and nobody's lagging back around there looking at the bushes or whatever it might be. Those sheep dog are keeping us rounded up, and the sheep dog has name, and one of them's name is goodness, and the other one's name is mercy. They don't leave. They're there forever and beyond. Yeah, yeah. And the very thing that we need from God is mercy. I've had people just foolishly say, well, one day when I stand before the Lord, I just want justice. To which I say, no, you don't. You want anything but justice. If you got what you deserved, you'd be in hell. You don't want justice. You want mercy. That's what you want. And thank God, that's what God gives us, his mercy. And then goodness, so see, mercy keeps us locked in and moving in the right direction. And then goodness, the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, just kind of moves right on there, right on in there with us. And so God protects us, God keeps us for all the rest of our days and then beyond into eternity. So in my life, God has not dealt with me in judgment. God has treated me with, with, with mercy and goodness. He's, he's lovingly forgiven me. He's been good to me. And his goodness is so good that, I'm, that I feel so terrible because I might be the biggest rascal that you've ever seen. And although I'm as bad as bad can be, God is as good as he can be to me. And so it's his goodness in the presence of my badness 
that makes me feel like a terrible dog because God's been good while I've been so bad that, it, that, that his goodness leads me to repent and say, God, forgive me. I'm such a wicked person in, in the presence of, of your goodness. Because when I die, my spirit doesn't die. My spirit lives somewhere forever. You remember I said you are a spirit, right? You have a soul and you live in a body. Well, when you die, your spirit goes immediately. Paul, the apostle Paul said, for me to be absent from this body is present with the Lord. Right now. So when you die, you're going somewhere right now. Wherever you choose, you make the choice. God says you choose life, choose life. There's a heaven that's greater than you've ever thought, and there's a hell that's worse than you ever thought. You make the choice. But the goodness of God is working to bring you to repentance because our spirit is going to spend eternity somewhere. So it, 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 is there anything that we can do or, or be that'll be more like our good shepherd and justify our bearing the name of Jesus? You know, the path of righteousness for the sake of his name. Is there anything we could more than that we would be simply good folks? Good folks are merciful. Good folks are forgiving. Good folks don't hold a grudge. Good folks don't try to get even. Good folks don't give people what they deserve. Good folks give goodness and mercy, thereby testifying that they are his children and that they are filled with the fruit of goodness. And that in the big picture, the overall thought is we are to be good people. All right, bow your head with me. Would you?